Thank you very much and good morning um, for inviting me at the, this meeting today, the 25th anniversary. Um, even though I am quite used to uh, speaking specifically within scientific um, audiences, I never get as nervous as I do speaking to yourselves. So um, the importance of uh, what I'm hoping to say, um, I always find uh, enlightening in, in presenting here today. What I want to do is just tell you about the London Project and the types of technologies we're using to address blindness. So in 2007, following a philanthropic donation from an, an American, and it was quite a large donation, we set up what is now known and has become quite large in terms of its publicity, the London Project to Cure Blindness. That was rather an ambitious title and basically wasn't giving a real indication of what we initially wanted to do, which was to take a cell therapy, and I'll explain this slightly more, into the clinic within a five-year period for age-related macular degeneration. It was a very ambitious start, a very ambitious project, uh, in that to go from basically um, almost nothing to a clinical application within five years is almost unheard of within medicine. Typically, it would take uh, 10 to 20 years. But we were sure that if we gathered the necessary people together, and those necessary people would be clinicians, engineers, scientists, and commercial organizations, then we would be able to achieve that goal. I am happy today to cut to the quick to say I think we have achieved that goal in terms of going into the clinic. Uh, no, 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 please, no, 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 it's my job, okay? <laughs> That's what I'm paid to do. Um, I'm pleased we've managed to get there. Uh, I'm not just pleased, I'm ecstatic we've got there, in fact. So it was set up from a philanthropic donation and was, the following year, in 2008, given the largest donation that the Macular Disease Society has given to any, any research project, which was of £100,000. That was crucial because it actually kept us afloat for a period which then enabled us to continue to gain the funding to just put it into context, that 100,000 was crucial, but the project itself to date has sourced over eight million pounds in order to actually get this project to where it is within that five years. I'm not just saying that as, oh wow, that's a large number. It just goes to show how complex and how expensive it is to take a therapeutic into clinic. In part, that financial commitment has now been taken on by Pfizer. Um, some people uh, through the project have actually said I've sold out to a commercial company. I haven't sold out at all. We need a commercial organization, a pharmaceutical company on board so that it can be produced as a medicine. I cannot produce it as a medicine myself. And they have given their assurance that if the trials go well, they will power it as fast as they can into everyday clinical use. So it was a very good move on our part to actually partner with Pfizer. In fact, again, it was one of the first for the projects that any pharmaceutical company as large as Pfizer came on board on a stem cell project. And in fact, it's still the first. And even when Pfizer decided to close down Sandwich, which it did, which was a large research component in Kent, the one thing they have actually kept in the UK is Pfizer Regenerative Medicine because of this project. So I'm pleased to have them on board. Okay, cut to the quick. What have we been doing? Stem cells, what are stem cells? Stem cells are the start cell. So every other organ in our body, not just our eyes, our heart, our lungs, our liver, are produced from a stem cell. 
That stem cell very early on is actually the egg uh, or the fertilized egg, which has the ability to turn into every other cell in our bodies. Unlike a number of press releases and a number of um, what we would call uh, stem cell tourism companies, stem cells themselves do not know what to do. They have the blueprint to actually develop into heart, lung, uh, eyes, but they do not just turn into those organs. That is a process of developmental biology. So a warning, there are a number of companies out there who profess to have a stem cell treatment, typically for more than just eye disease. It will cure everything, spinal injury, autism, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's. These companies are just cranks. They have no evidence. They have no uh, ability to even say that's possible with what they're um, presenting. They charge large amount of money and are present in, the, in Europe as well. A company in Germany just last year was closed down because of these types of claims and was closed down after a very sad uh, event in which cells were injected into a boy which resulted in his death. So beware of false prophets, so to speak, in the stem cell arena. Only those trials in which cells have been through a regulatory process within a country, whether it be Europe, whether it be the US, or whether it be Asia, as long as it's been through some type of clinical trial, and those scientists have then produced it to a medicine, should you consider any type of therapy. But stem cells, how then? So the London Project had to work out and understand how to produce an eye cell from the stem cell. So we're not putting a stem cell into an eye. We're putting the eye cell that dies through the disease into the eye. And specifically for age-related macular degeneration, we're putting the cell which dies in that disease which su supports the seeing part of the eye. So it's that layer of cells right at the back of the eye. And what we managed within the first year of the project was to do that. We turned the stem cell into the eye cell that's affected in age-related macular degeneration. So that was the first process. You then have to go through at least four components to bring it into the clinic. One of them is you have to do what's a preclinical package which is, okay, you have a cell, you can turn it into the eye cell that's affected. Can you then show us, and who we are showing, I'll tell you in a minute, can you show us that it has any beneficial effect in any animal model which has a similarity to the disease the patient is suffering? And we did. We showed that replacing it in an animal in which it, that same cell is diseased, does actually maintain the vision in that animal. So that was our preclinical package. You then have to manufacture the cells to a clinical grade standard, which is not an insignificant task. It means you have to do it under a whole kite marking standard and you have to bring engineers and manufacturers in. And this is where the beauty of the project has been. We brought everyone on board right at the start to figure out how we would do it. So we manufactured the cells. We even bought the license to the cells. At the time, Pfizer wasn't there. I actually took the um, decision to spend an awful lot of money buying a cell line, which I knew then would be our cell line. We could do it, and we could take it to clinic. We did, and we manufactured it. And in fact, in May of this year, we've started the clinical manufacture for the trial to start next year. That clinical manufacturing will finish in February. So post-February, we will be ready to use it in the clinic. It will be fully manufactured. Pfizer have now banked. And so just like a bank with pounds, you have banks with cells in. 
And Pfizer have now three banks of this particular set of line that we bought for them. So they have one in Scotland, they have one just outside London, and they have one in the US. So if there's any earthquakes anywhere, hopefully they won't happen in the US and the UK at the same time. So we have banks now, which means theoretically, well, it's not even theoretically, practically we can treat the whole of the population if we needed to. So we've manufactured those cells. We then have to go into a discussion with the UK regulators who determine whether you can use that in a patient. We also had another problem, which is we were so at the cutting edge, we had to design our own surgical tools, in fact. Now, I came from Sheffield, so <laughs> surprise, surprise... <laughs> I went back to Sheffield and said, guys, we need some help to do this surgical tool because it was microsurgery. And to my great uh, pleasure, they managed to produce a surgical tool for us. What I didn't realise was then you have to go through another regulatory route to get that surgical tool approved. And I can say now, and again, it just happened this week, we've now got approval and what's called a CE mark for that surgical tool. So everything is nicely coming together. Um, that surgical tool, I must admit, to develop, cost me more than the car that I have, <laughs> which um, I was amazed, given that the tool's that big. <laughs> but anyway, we can manufacture the tools as well. One of the obvious questions which you'll probably ask us is, well, how do I get on the trial? The answer is you can't. It's very specific, it's very regulated, it will be dependent on uh, a number of criteria and uh, will be based out of uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital. So there's no list, unfortunately, that you can come onto um, for that clinical trial. Um, in fact, the patient group we were looking at will be um, fast declining vision in a certain clinical population. So that's where we are. It's taken us, we said it would take us five years, and uh, seven plus five is 12. So I reckon we did it, um, which really pleases me. Um, current trials. You would have already have heard of a company called Advanced Cell Therapeutics, or ACT. They initiated a trial in July of last year in the United States, in Los Angeles, on two clinical populations. One was Stargardt's disease, and one was age-related macular degeneration. That trial is still ongoing. They've treated a number of patients now, and a second arm on the Stargardt's trial was initiated in January of this year at Moorfields Eye Hospital. Um, their technique is similar but dissimilar to what we're trying to achieve. They are just injecting cells in to see whether the cells will produce some type of a trophic factor, which is a, a helpful chemical to stop the progression of the disease. Um, in the publication that also came out in January there was an indication that at least in the Stargardt's patient that there was some visual improvement. I can say now and honestly that was a rather premature publication. It was one patient. And equally, it was only three months post-surgery. Again, while it's hopeful, it is a safety trial to examine whether the cells are tolerated by the patient and whether those cells do not cause any adverse problems. That, we can say at the moment, is true. There are no adverse complications. In terms of are they really helping visual improvement, I would say at the moment we still don't know. In the age-related macular degeneration uh, trial, um, there is difficulties because these patients are having to take considerable doses of immunosuppressants, which is not very easy. 
and a number of those patients have had to come off the trial because they can't tolerate the immunosuppression. So again, on the AMD arm, again, I would say it's too early. What is good, what is very good, which is a first in this area, is that human embryonic stem cell, which have been used to produce eye cells, do not cause problems in the eye. That's a big, big indication. That's very good. Um, in terms of the improvement or the maintenance of vision, we don't know yet. As I say, there's not enough patients that have um, gone through those procedures. Future developments. As I just mentioned, one of the problems with these cells are they're not donor-matched. So there is an issue about rejection, as there is with any organ transplantation. These are cells. They're not too dissimilar to an organ in terms of transplantation. So there is a possibility of rejection. The London Project um, and myself don't stay still. We've already started the next arm of the project, which is to try and combat this problem, this problem of rejection. And what we've been developing is a new technology, which is we can produce the stem cell from your cells. So we can take a piece of your skin and we can turn back time. So your skin still has the blueprint of how it was developed. So we can turn the clock back and turn it back into a stem cell and then turn that stem cell into the eye cell. We've managed that. We've done that now a number of times using various new technologies which we and others have developed. Why are we doing this? It's because then literally you will have a donor-matched piece of tissue. So there would be no issue about rejection. So we have developed that um, at Moorfields and uh, UCL and are in the process now of approaching the National Blood and Transfusion and also the Medical Research Council. And thankfully Pfizer are on board as well to see whether we can develop that now for clinical use. So they're the new development. Equally, a publication that came out this year which really has changed things completely is the ability almost to grow a whole eye in a dish, a whole retina. Now, it came from, the technology came from Japan. We've actually started a similar project in the UK using those patient-derived stem cells, so using the patient from the skin. It's in its infancy, to say the least. It only started a couple of months ago. But we're hopeful that that may even open up other kinds of transplantation. Because, as ever, a question which will come from the floor is, OK, you keep talking about these stem cells, replacing eye cells. Are you going to give me my vision back? Or are you going to tell me it's just going to maintain it as it is? At the moment, I can only say I can maintain the vision as is. But this new technology, the eye in the dish, gives a real potential to actually restore vision. So if you've lost vision, it might be the case that we could use this as a way of repopulating that diseased eye completely. It is very new. Could I actually say I do the same as I've done it in the uh, AMD project and say in five years' time I'll go to clinic again with a brand new one? I would hope so. And that's the goal of speaking with the National Blood and Transplant and also the MRC. We are pushing very hard to get these projects through to clinic as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So finally, I just want to talk about government for a change. They keep talking about me. I keep talking about the time I talked about them. It was with the Macular Disease Society and other charities that when the coalition government came in, there was a real fear that they may cut research funding. And it was a real fear. There was a um, possibility of anywhere from 40 to an 80% cut in medical research funding. As a way of combating that, um, Moorfields and the Institute of Ophthalmology, myself, 
invited Lord Howe and Professor Sally Davis, who's now head of the National Health Service, to come to UCL and to Moorfields and look at the work which we were trying to achieve and trying to take forward into the clinic. I would say as a result, not a complete result of my own work, but also from work from the MDS and other charities, what happened was government decided not to cut medical research, which was great. They didn't increase it, but they didn't cut us, which was phenomenal. So that was great. What they have announced, because of this collaboration we've had with Pfizer, they've now gone nationwide on regenerative medicine. They've gone really over the top on trying to see whether there's other diseases which could be appropriate for regenerative medicine. And they've now set up a regenerative medicine platform. What I'm here today is to ask the Macular Disease Society membership to pressure your MPs because that regenerative medicine platform, they're not including at the moment I, which I find distasteful given that the eye is the major place in which regenerative medicine is now seeing clinical benefit. So if you have any MP that you are in any way talk to, please pressure them to make sure that the regenerative medicine platform includes the eye. The major one at the moment is heart, but the eye should be there as well. So again, thank you very much for your support. The research grants that you've now introduced, which are huge in terms of three-year potential grants for research into macular disease, I think is a phenomenal move by the society and one which will uh, increase our capacity in maintaining and uh, translating therapies for macular disease. Thanks very much. Thank you.